Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing? Well, I'm pretty relaxed. <laughs> I've had a nice relaxing day today, and um, I just got out of the shower about a half an hour ago. It is 10.14, so it's not super late, and um, I'm gonna listen to some of my audiobook tonight. Alex is going to bed early, and he has to be up super early tomorrow morning. And let's see, what did I do today? Oh, I did a lot of things, I'll tell you. I'll tell you all about my day. But last night, uh, that's why my hair is like, I let it air dry, I know it doesn't look great, but, and I have my hat right here. But I kind of feel like just uh, wearing my, she is fixing her lips right there. Okay, she must have a hot day. <laughs> But, um, I feel like just kind of letting my, my hair just be in the wind tonight. Anyway, um, do you ever, like, take a nap or sleep so deep? I, like, got up and I was like, oh my god, I need to, like, <clears throat> take a shower and wake myself up and feel really refreshed and good. And so I, um, got in the shower and I used all my favorite products. I used my Lush Fairly Traded Honey and... Well, I use this conditioner. It's not my favorite. It's this American Crew conditioner. We're literally almost at the very, 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 very bottom of it. Thankfully, because it's not my favorite. Um, but it is, it's like minty feeling. I don't know how to explain it. It feels like kind of cool in your scalp. But like, I don't like the smell of it. The smell of it is horrible. And um, I like my hair products to kind of like smell. I like all like my hair bath products and stuff to smell good. I feel like that's, you know, part of the idea. It, um. I don't even really know how to explain how it smells. I think I explained it one time as smelling like like BO. It just like the, the, the conditioner does not smell great. But um, so anyway, I took a shower and then I came downstairs and was looking at stuff on the computer. I'm starting my Optavia plant program back up again tomorrow, but I'm like, my plant, it's supposed to like send out the food this week because I moved it back, but I'm gonna, I moved it back again because I, I have all this food and I haven't been sticking to it. So tomorrow's my day. Oh, I found my magic book. I went and I looked at underneath my cabinet and got my magic book out because I'm gonna start uh, Rhonda Burns Magic tomorrow. I wrote the dates in the book when I did it before. It's funny, like I didn't write the year, but I wrote like the month because it has like, I started it on February 5th. It's like two slash five. So I must have done it in February the last time that I did it. I almost kind of wonder if I didn't, so I haven't talked about this one here for a while, but there were several years that I wasn't going to meetings, and I came back in January. I almost kind of wonder if I didn't start that book the February after I came back to meetings, because that would be consistent then with Alex saying, like, that I felt so, I seemed so different, I seemed so happy, because I hadn't been like that for a while and then like coming back and like you know being in meetings again working with my sponsor and then the book working on gratitude it just got really cold in here what I think make a lot of sense is why I was presenting as really positive and happy at that time I don't know I just speculating I really have no idea I don't even know when that book came out but um so yeah last night when I got done vlogging I Listen to a little bit of my audiobook. Oh, I know what I did. I went and picked up Alex and his mom. And then, um, <coughs> not Alex and his mom, Alex and his aunt. And I took his aunt home. And then took Alex home. And I was like, by that point, I was like wide awake. I was like, I cannot fall asleep. And so, um, I sat on the front porch and I watched an episode of and a half of Girls Incarcerated which is really good this season. It's very sad, you know, but I talked about it on here last night, so I'm not gonna talk about it on here at night, but if you're looking for a, like a reality series, it's a good reality series. And, um, you know, I was watching it last night, I was thinking to myself that like, I think one of the most powerful things, there's like a girl and she she graduates with her GED and then she leaves the same day she's released. And, um, well there's two of them. And they both leave on the same day and graduate on the same day. And 
both of them are like real hopeful for their futures, you know? And I think there's something to be said about, have you ever seen like hope in somebody's eyes? I don't know what is going on with this camera that it like pushes so far down and it's being back, but it makes me look like I'm hiding down this chair. But, um, have you ever seen hope like that in somebody's eyes? Like it's a pretty, that's a pretty powerful thing, you know? And you can tell this one girl, like, the other girl doesn't really talk a whole lot about it, but the, the, this other girl, she's like, she really believes in herself, and she's like, you know, like, I never thought that this was possible, and she's talking about getting her high school diploma, you know, in the girl, girl school, and she's like, if I can do that here, after all the obstacles I face, she's like, I can do anything, and you know, like, I think that's really a hard thing in when you're talking about, like, somebody that's a substance user or an addict or an alcoholic like I was, you know, it's like, you're so down on yourself for so long that you, like, for me, I just was really convinced that I wasn't worth anything, you know, that even though I had people in my life that were telling me my value, you know, my mom and my dad were always, you know, even though my mom was in her own addiction, I mean, she was always very supportive of me. My dad has been probably my biggest, you know, cheerleader my entire life. And, um, he left me the neatest, he sent me the neatest text yesterday. We talked, but he also sent me the neatest text. I wanted to, he said something about, I wish I was your age going to places I've never been before or something like that. What did he say? I wanted to read it. My stepmom left me a really nice text too, or sent me a really nice text. What was that? Oh, he also sent me a picture of their dog. Um, he said, uh, "This is before we talked." He said, "Happy birthday, dude! Wish I was your age again and going where I've never been." And, and you know, I think that's kind of like an exciting thing about getting older, or not even just getting older, but like your next year of birth or going into 2020 or whatever is, where are we going to go? Like, like I, you know, not like just as a trip, but in life, like, what are we going to learn that we've never learned before? What are we going to be introduced to? Or, you know, like what new food or I remember like in college when I finally kind of figured out, like going to class on the first day of school was really fun because you had no idea was who was going to be in your class. Like, maybe it was going to be your next crush or something. You know what I mean? I was always looking for the next boyfriend. <laughs> Serious. I mean, back then I was. But that was before I got sober and I was... I would... I mean, back then my longest relationships were, like, very short... I would date people, but it was real toxic because we all used, you know, like there's nothing more toxic than two addicts in a relationship together. I mean, nothing like it's just, I look back and I think about, I, I think that's part of the reason why I don't really consider those like real relationships, you know, because I look back on those relationships that I had and not all of the guys were like horrible, but a, a, enough of them were. Um, and I'm sure I wasn't the, the greatest boyfriend either. You know what I mean? I know I wasn't. But I look back on that and it was just... Like, very chaotic. Like, lots of partying. Lots of fighting. Just... And, and I guess I thought that's what a relationship was back then, you know? Because I wasn't healthy. And, and I have to say, like... When I got sober, dating was hard. And, um, you know, I've told this story on here, but, like, I literally got out of treatment and got into a relationship, which don't do. Like, that is so frowned upon, but you couldn't tell me anything. And, um, and then I got out of that one and got right into another relationship. And then I waited because my sponsor asked me to or told me to. Well, he didn't tell me to, but he was like, are you going to do what I told you to do now or what I suggested now? Because he had told me not to get in a relationship. I was like, yes, I'm ready to listen to what you have to say because my life is miserable. I'm not happy going in and out of these relationships. But then I did date somebody later that year. That was what I consider my first um, like long-term relationship because we were together about five years. But 
think back of myself sometimes then, you know, like... I dated this guy. The last guy that I dated before I went into treatment. Who was not nice to me. Not at all. But, like, I mean, I wasn't a good boyfriend, you know, either. I'm not making excuses for him because he just was not a good person. And, um... But we had broken up before I went into treatment. And I can remember being in treatment and literally being consumed with him. Like my first week and a half, two weeks. Like constantly on the phone. Wondering where he was, what he was doing. Calling on my friends. And I remember my counselor came out and she just like, I was talking on the phone. And she like walked towards me. Or I don't know how it happened. But anyway, she just hung up the phone on me. And I turn around, I go... What are you doing? Like, I went off. Oh, my God. I was like, I thought I was it. I thought you did not mess with me. <laughs> and she goes, you're done with personal phone calls. It's distracting you or something like that. I can't remember what she said, but she was like, I mean, she had had it. Because I would, like, get out of group and go to the phones. I would, like, wake up, go to the phones. I would, like, leave a meeting early and go to the phones. Like, I was spending all of my time on the phones. But I think it's powerful to see hope in somebody's eyes, you know? I sometimes wonder to myself when that hope, like, started. Like, you know, I didn't get sober, clean and sober, and then, like, I was, like, in it to win it, you know? Like, I can remember tricking myself in early sobriety and saying things like... Well, I'm just going to do this as long as everybody, until everybody's off my ass, mostly my dad, and um, all my legal stuff was done, and then I was going to be like, okay, then I'm going to go back to using. But, like, deep down inside, like, I really knew, like, out of all of it, like, my drinking was, I mean, I used everything, right? But my drinking was a huge, huge problem. Like... When you talk about, when you hear people talk about, I did not realize I was this close to empty on my, um, in my gas. But when you talk about people that are like, one is too many and a thousand is never enough, or where the night, when you start, you don't know when to stop. Like, that was the definition of me. And when I heard people talking about that, I was like, ooh. Oh, and I'm having these things called blackouts, which I knew what they were, right? That, like, I'm not remembering the rest of the night, and people are telling me the next day things that I did, and I'm not remembering it. Like, this is a serious problem. And, um, I think I'm gonna go down to the speedway and keep on talking for a little bit. But, um, yeah, like, I knew, like, the drinking was really bad, but I didn't think my smoking pot was bad. I smoked pot all day, every day. Literally all day, every day. I did not think my smoking pot was a problem. I definitely did not think that the cocaine use was a problem because I hadn't been doing it for very long, even though that was just bleeding me of money that I don't even know where I was getting the money. And then pills, I was eating left and right, if you had asked me at the time, what are your drugs of choice? I would have said alcohol and Vicodin. Like, those were my two drugs of choice. Um, like, those were the things I really, like, when I got serious in treatment at first, because I had several moments of clarity, you know, where I was like, okay, you need to be here. Oh, okay, you really need to be, okay, you need to be here and you need to deal with this. I mean, it didn't just happen to me all at once. It happened to me in waves, you know? And um, if you had asked me early on, I would have said, I don't think that I can handle Vicodin or any kind of pills. Because if you, whatever kind of pill, I didn't care what it did, I would eat it. And I was very like Alice in Wonderland with that. You know, like, this one will make you bigger. I mean, I just liked pills. And I felt like they were kind of like... I don't know what this was about with me, but like with my drug use, I always had an issue with um, like thinking that like certain drugs were kind of like seedy or like um, kind of like dark and like ugly, right? Like I, I did not like like hallucinogens or, you know, when we would go to like 
people's houses and they would just, it just like, I did not, and that was part of the reason why I didn't love cocaine. Like I, why I was, because it just always seemed very dirty and messy and people were cutting it and it just, the whole scene I didn't like. And, um, you know, a lot of that stuff was just, it just was dirty to me. I just didn't like it, but pills were clean, you know? And a drink you put into a glass. And what's so funny is that in retrospect, when I looked back on what my life looked like, my life was dirty and gross, okay, and seedy. It just was. Like, I was living this just disgusting life, you know? And But I didn't think that at the time, you know? Like, I mean, we're so in our own heads that we think we have it all figured out. We don't have it any have any of it figured out, you know? But I knew that I probably couldn't handle pills because I loved pills. And I loved, like, when you would... And I didn't like to snort them. I, I had done that, but I didn't like to snort them. I liked to eat them because I liked when you would... You just didn't know when they would kick in. The idea of feeling... I was talking, talking about this to a friend of mine not too long ago. The idea of being, like, not knowing where I was going to end up. Like, there was a part of me that really liked that. Um, of like waking up on, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I woke up on people's like front porches on their like swings or couches, you know, or like just in the, I woke up in the weirdest places, honest to God I did. And I look back on that and how scary that was, you know, like I, I really have no idea how I ever made it out of that. And, um, I don't know, but I did, you know, and I can't deny that gift now. I mean, in retrospect, I can't look back and be like. Okay, th this was serious. Like, I made it out. And, I mean, and that's why I share my story. Because I, you know, want other people to know. Like, maybe our stories are not identical. But I think that, like, anybody being in the... Because you, like, when you're in the middle of it, the, the thing is... The scariest thing is you have no idea what your life is going to look like. Like, without it, Right? And, like, people always ask me, like, what's treatment like? I'm really scared to go to treatment. Well, you can't really tell somebody what an experience is like until they do it themselves, right? So, I think there's all this fear about stopping. I don't think it's that people don't want to stop. And I don't think it's that people don't have a feeling that they need to stop. I think it's that they're afraid to stop. I know that that was what it was for me. I, like, had no idea what my life was going to look like if I stopped drinking and using drugs. Like, I was terrified of it. And what I didn't really understand was at that point, I was kind of equating it to the party. Like, well, then I'm not going to have any, like, partying in my life. You know, my life's going to be boring. But it really wasn't about that. I think I didn't get it. But on a subconscious level, it was like, how am I going to deal with all of these issues that I have? How am I going to numb my feelings and my emotions? But I didn't know how to put that into words. You know what I mean? So, I'm going to pump my gas and then I'll come back and I'll talk about when I think like the hope hit me. Because I do think that it hit me at a certain moment, but I, it wasn't in retrospect when I thought it was gonna be. I've said the word retrospect about a thousand times tonight. Okay, I will be back in just a second. So let me tell you about my life. <laughs> oh Lord! Baby, I was born sweat. Um, because that's probably why you watch this vlog is because you want to know about my life, right? <laughs> You're like, no, we really like couldn't care about this. There is something about a gas station late at night in the summer that I love. I don't even know what it is. I couldn't even explain it if I tried. <laughs> I actually, years ago, I started this book that I was working on about these two sisters. And they lived in a trailer park with their mom, who was a stripper and a heroin addict. And it's over 4th of July weekend and she dies in the trailer from an overdose. And they don't know what to do. But the whole thing starts off at the gas station and they're watching everybody go away, like leave for the weekend, because they don't relate to that because they've never seen it. So it's like exciting for them. And they sit at the gas station and they're like watching people go away. Okay, so here's my story before I pick up my fountain pop, because let me just tell you, I got a fountain pop. And it's something that I don't ever drink. So did you know that there was a thing called Speedway TV? I did not. So anyway, apparently all these gas stations now have um, TV. There's also gas station TV. Now they have those usually at BP. Um, and BP, which is a gas station if you didn't know, 
they have gas station TV. I filled my tank. Can I just tell you it? Like, I, my gas tank it lasts a lot longer in here, but it takes cost me sixty dollars to fill up my gas tank. Like that is ridiculous. But anyway, um, I think I'm gonna go this way. I don't ever go out this way. Um, baby, I was born this way. Um. Oh, by the way, Melissa and Jason went and saw both the the Gaga shows in Vegas and said that they were incredible. Jason was so floored with, and their, t their seats were really good too, but he was so floored with the, um, the piano. So she's doing two nights. She's doing like her concert show, like regular show, and then she's doing like a piano night. So, um, why can I not think of his name? So they went out there and they saw it. And so it's her basically sitting at a piano and she has a full band. I mean, Jason said that like each uh, band member has like a podium that they sit behind and play. Who's the guy that she sang the song with? He's part of the Rat Pack. Why can't I think of his name? Um, somebody's out, it's like Dean Martin, somebody like that singing cheek to cheek. So she starts singing it, right? And down the aisle he comes. And so he's like sings as part of her show because he just happened to be in Vegas that night. But anyway, they said it was really worth it. Okay, so anyway, flashback away from that. Um, I just, for some reason I don't know what that why that what I just said made me think of this, but I thought, uh, what is it called? Tight as a small as a feather, stiff as a board. Do you guys remember that game that you used to play as a kid? Tight as a feather, small as a feather. Light as a light as a feather, stiff as a board. Do you guys remember that? And then you would like lift people up into the air and you'd be like, oh my god, we're lifting her! When in like all reality you're like this. <laughs> but you're trying to act like you're just lifting her up on your pit your like finger. Okay, that's a lie. Anyway. So I'm sitting there outside the gas station and it is hot and I'm thirsty because of course I forgot to bring my bottle of water with me. I do have my coffee, but I didn't get coffee today because I had enough coffee at Patashu that I didn't want any when I left. So, um, and uh, like I have my leftover coffee from Patashu, so I didn't go through Starbucks today. So anyway, I was thirsty and I was like, damn it, I forgot to bring my bottle of water, right? And um, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, watching uh, Speedway TV, which apparently is different than gas station TV. Gas station TV is the number one gas station television station in the country. Now I know that because I've watched it enough to know by now that it's, that's what it is, okay? So don't fight me on it, you're wrong. I'm just gonna tell you if I've watched it enough to know. And basically what it is, if you wanna know what gas station television is, what all the stations like Speedway TV is, and gas station TV and whatever other gas station television stations there are, they're not they're not soap operas and movies. So I mean, you don't have that long, right? They want to get you, they want to catch you and like get it up. So you get like weather reports, you get like quick news, but it's usually entertainment news, and then lots of ads for the shit that you need to go buy when go inside the gas station and buy, right? I go to Thornton's usually, and I don't think that Thornton's even has. Uh, a, uh, what do you call it? I don't think they even have a kind of television station there. If they do, it's muted or something. But I'm sitting out there and they have this ad for Mountain Dew. Now let me just tell you, I have not drank Mountain Dew in so long. When I first started working in treatment, speaking of all that, the first year I worked there and I was a tech, which basically means we just like, you know, took patients everywhere or whatever. Like I, um, so I had to take people to meetings and like everybody, every patient that came through that hospital, I swear to God, like, cause they could have gum and soda outside the meetings and smoke cigarettes. But at that point they could smoke still on the campus. Like every patient that came through the hospital smoked Newports, chewed orange gum and drank Mountain Dew. So guess what, Peter? I start smoking Newports, which I love Newports. Oh my God, I smoked Newports for a couple years. Actually back in the day, and I shouldn't be talking about all this on here, but do you remember Newport Ice Lights? They were so strong, they like, you couldn't get them in the United States. Well, you could, I think, for a little while, and then they like made them so you couldn't get them, but you could get them out of the country. Because I do remember when, uh, that was my first boyfriend and I, we went to Grand Cayman with my dad and my stepmom, and I bought a pack there. And like the waitress on the beach, she was like, can I have one of those? I've never seen those before. And I was like, yeah. So anyway, but I am, 
sitting there tonight and I'm watching the gas station or a Speedway, sorry, excuse me, there's a huge difference, Speedway television and they have this ad for Mountain Dew that looks so delicious. So I sure to go inside and get myself a Mountain Dew. I have not had a Mountain Dew, you guys, and I need to tell you, what year did I start working there? 2000 or 1995? I started working there 24 years ago, you guys. That is crazy. I'm old. Well, yeah. Baby, I was born this way. Well, I don't hate it. I have to say that. I do kind of like it. It's kind of a summary drink. <laughs> This is such a stupid conversation. This is kind of conversations my mom and I would have had back in the day. Tanya Jean is so strict on her soda. She will, like, I'll try different things, right? Fanta, sure, why not? Fanta raspberry, sure, why not? <clears throat> One of the things I'm absolutely obsessed with is those machines, you know, that have like the thousand Cokes in them and you push the different buttons and then you can make like a grape cherry root beer. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh my God, I love those machines. But the thing is, every time I go there, I always get the same thing, vanilla root beer. Why wouldn't you? It's fantastic. So I always get the Barks vanilla root beer. In fact, it wasn't too long ago I was going through there and I was like, I should try something completely different. My mother, back in the day, she loved cherry aids and limeades. If you don't know what those are, then look them at. But anyway, but it's basically like 7-Up and Cher like a Shirley Temple, okay? And we have Steak and Shake in Indianapolis, which we've had for years and years and years. And um, I, Alex and I used to love Steak and Shake. Now, let me just put this in perspective for you, okay? Now, back in the day, I mean, I was working out every day. I could eat at some steak and shake. So Alex and I would go out after a night of dancing. I was a good 60, 70 pounds center than I am now. And after we had been out all night long, we would go to steak and shake, okay? And we would each get a bowl, not a cup, a bowl of chili with cheese. And we got this obscene amount of oyster crackers. You guys know those little crackers that look like oysters? Obscene amount. So we were basically eating crackers or chili with our crackers. And then we would each get Frisco Burgers, which is basically a patty melt, but it has uh, like Thousand Island dressing on it. Oh my God, so good. And then like I would get onion rings and he would get french fries. And then on top of it, we would split an order of chicken fingers. Can you even imagine? I think we'd get chicken fingers and fries and split the fries. So, and sometimes I got cheese fries. And sometimes I got a shake because they're steak and shake. So they have like the best shakes in the entire world. Well, my mother and my aunt used to love Steak and Shake. It looks like a diner, you know, with like the black and white tiles on the floor and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's a cute little diner chain. It's not super expensive either. That's actually one of the ways that I knew that my mom was like really sick because that January, when she got sick, but she didn't know what was going on. Um, it was January or maybe early February, I don't know, but I called her and I was like, I'm gonna stop by, do you want something to eat? And she was like, no, I haven't really eaten in a couple days. Well, my aunt had told me that my mom was refusing to eat, like she just wouldn't eat, right? And I was like, and my mother would not turn down a free meal ever, like ever. And uh, she loved fast food, she loved going out, she loved ice cream. So I went through, um, steak and shake on the way over to my mom's house and I got her like a double cheeseburger with like all the toppings. My mother loved a, my nose is driving me crazy. I don't know if it's from my beard or what it is but my mother loved a double cheeseburger or a cheeseburger with like everything. Ketchup, mayo, lettuce onions mustard, ketchup, mayonnaise, relish. She loved everything. I mean, if she was gonna get a cheeseburger, she was gonna get it all. I mean, the messiest cheeseburger in the entire world. And then she'd take a bite and she'd be like, oh my God, this is so good. She loved all that, right? And then I got her an order of fries and then I got her a shake because my mother loved chocolate malted shakes. I got her a large shake. So I took it over there and I will never forget showing up and she was laying on, we don't have this couch anymore, but she had like this couch in her living room. 
and she was laying on it watching TV and she had her feet covered with this blanket. And my mom just like sitting at the house, like in the middle of the day. And I was like, are you okay? And she's like, I've just been so sick. I had the flu and what my mom had, Wegner's vasculitis granulatosis, a lot of times you get like after you've been sick. And um, she's like, I just don't know what's wrong. I'm just like really lethargic. I'm like really tired. Like it's, it's just a lot for me to even get downstairs. And so when I come downstairs, like I almost don't even want to go back upstairs again, you know? And I was like, well, I brought you the steak and shake. Do you want me to put it on a plate for you and stuff? And my mom and I love to get uh, fast food and then put it on plates. Like I'm still to this day, if I get fast food, I put it on a, like a plate plate. Um, and she was like, sweetie, I'm just really not that hungry. And I was like, well, when was the last time that you ate, mom? And she was like, um, she was like, I don't know. She was like, you know, Kathy brought some stuff by and I ate a little bit of that. And I went in the refrigerator and like my aunt had bought like cottage cheese and whatever. And my mother had not touched any of it. And I go, mom, you need to eat something. And I said, let me put this on a plate for you. She literally took like one bite of this cheeseburger and like two fries and that was it. And I knew, I was like, something is not right. And you know, later in my mom's journals, I found that she had said like when we had gone to Gatlinburg that December when she was completely fine, she wasn't telling me this, but she said something, she wrote something about that she couldn't even keep an entire orange down, that she had like eaten an orange and she like vomited it up and that she knew something was wrong then. And, um, but she didn't want to do anything about it. Sad. But, so yeah, so Alex and I used to go there to the Steak and Shake, and we would eat, um, you know, late at night. Why was I telling that story? I don't even know why I told that story. Does anybody remember? I was talking about Speedway. I was talking about Mountain Dew. I was talking about... Somebody said to me on the vlog last night, they said, it's so funny how you like can turn off the vlog and like when you turn it back on, you know exactly where you're at. Well, like if I'm at the end, like 23 and a half minutes, so like the time starts like ticking in red and sometimes I see it, sometimes I don't. But then like, you know, it's like usually like I'm going right on. I have a hard time with it when I change the battery or whatever because I actually like pull over and I'm like changing the battery and so I'm kind of like stopping thinking for a second. And I don't know what I was talking about with the, why I was telling that story. We used to eat like that all the time. I remember this one time Alex and I, oh, no, 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 no. I know I was gonna tell this story. Okay, I was working that up because my aunt, Kathy, after my mom died, so we went and we made the funeral arrangements at the funeral home, Caroline and my aunt, Kathy and I. And so after that, like Caroline had business that she had to go do. And so my aunt was like, do you wanna go get something to eat? And I was like, yeah, I was, I was, I was preempting the story to tell you like how much I can eat at, at, at uh, uh, Steak and Shake. So I said, sure. So we went to Steak and Shake, the one right up the street. And she was like, this was your mom and I's favorite Steak and Shake. We would go here back in the day. And I was like, oh, really? And she was like, yeah. It was right where, like, they, by where they had grown up. And, um, like, because they used to go to, like, diners like that. Like, in Riverdale, like, that Pops Diner. Like, my mom, like, there used to be a diner here called the Teepee that was, like, right by the state fairgrounds. It was, like, this huge teepee. And it was a diner, and they used to go there. And there's, like, pictures in my mom's yearbook of, like, her, like, sitting at the counter with, like, a friend. And it's supposed to be, like, an ad for the teepee. But anyway, they took it down. I remember when I was a kid. It wasn't still operational. But I remember seeing it on the corner there. Um... And like they really, I mean, this was in the 50s. They really would like go and, you know, like after a sock hop, go and, you know, get a, a cherry drizzle or fizzle or whatever those drinks are called, you know, at the, the teepee. My mom used to talk about that all the time. So we sit down and I'm like looking through the menu and I am so hungry. And um, <laughs> the waiter comes, waiter or waitress comes, and I'm like ready to order like a double cheeseburger, you know? And my aunt goes, um, she goes, uh, we'll have um, a single cheeseburger with a fry, 
and she said, and I'll have a Coke. And she goes, what will you have? And I start ordering, and my aunt goes, oh no, we're sharing that. <laughs> she goes, what drink do you want? Or something like that. I was like, what? We're sharing a single cheeseburger and some fries? I was like, God. She's like, you don't need any more than that. I was like, okay, Aunt Kathy. I wasn't even that heavy at the time either, my lord. But, yeah. This one time after, we used to go to this thing. It was like this day club thing at this restaurant that's on Geist Reservoir here in Indianapolis. And it was called Rehab, like Rehab in Las Vegas. So if you don't know, I don't even know if they still have it. But there was like this pool party in Vegas during the day and it was called Rehab. So we used to go to this one because the website that we run, like we would sponsor it sometimes and it was called Rehab. So we like would like be there every week and like did this little MC thing and stuff. It was horrible. I hated it. I hated every minute of it. And, um, <laughs> like, I'd have fun for, like, the first hour, and then people just legit, it was, like, people docking their boats and coming up, and they were, like, just so ridiculously drunk. I hated it. But the thing I did love was that every time that when it was over, we would go home and we would eat. Well, we also got, come on, camera, don't do this tonight. We also got, always got a cabana for free. Come on. We always got a cabana for free and like all of our food and drinks and stuff like that um, for free. So that was nice. And um, the only time that we had to pay for it was actually Alex's birthday, which was actually before all that. So, but did we get our food for free or just the drinks? I think maybe we just got our drinks for free. But we had, and I think we just got our drinks for free. Anyway, it was okay, but Afterwards, we'd always go out to eat. Well, I remember one of the first times we ever did it. I was so hungry on the way home. And we were, like, ready to go home and take naps. It had been, like, 100 degrees outside. We were burnt. I was ready just to get home. And Alex said, um, Let, let's stop somewhere and get something and just eat it real quick. And I was like, I love to eat in fast food places. I don't know what it is about, but I love, like going into like a McDonald's and just like sitting there and eating like in the McDonald's where you get like, you know, the push ketchup that you put in the little things and whatever. So anyway, um, I, we go to Burger King and I love a Whopper from Burger King. Okay. Like I love, now I have been a vegetarian for it's coming up on two years in August. So I haven't had a Big Mac or a, and a Big Mac and all that kind of stuff since August 1st of 2017. I haven't had any of that. But God, do I miss it. I will tell you that the Impossible Burger from Cheesecake Factory and White Castle is probably 10 times better though. So it doesn't really matter. And it's plant-based. But I, um, what was I going to say? So I, we go into Burger King, and this is like the first year that we dated. It was the summer after, it was the summer after the first year that we dated. So this is 10 years ago. And uh, I go to the counter, and Alex is like, oh, the other thing that I love that I haven't had in two years is the original chicken sandwich from White Castle. It's like the long sandwich. It has just like lettuce and mayonnaise on it. It's so good. What else do I love from there? Oh, the French, uh, the French, uh, what do you call it? Sticks. Uh, French toast sticks. Those are pretty good, too. What else? I love Burger King. But do you know what I really love from Burger King that Alex got me started on? This is so bad, you guys. I'm sure there's like 3,000 3, calories in it. So we go in there. We go up to the counter. And I'm getting ready to get my Whopper with cheese, you know, and like a little onion ring and stuff like that. He orders a double Whopper with cheese, Okay. Now, I knew that they had him on there, but I thought that was for real a joke, that people didn't really get him. So he gets a double Whopper with cheese, two large fries, two large fries, my Lord. We sat there and ate, and he was like, if you've never had a double Whopper with cheese, I was like, no, so I got one, and I was totally hooked, like, right away. I think one time I took him through there, and he got a triple Whopper with cheese, too. My husband can eat and not gain a whole lot of weight. He's been, like, real hard on himself, like, recently. He's like, I'm gaining all my weight back. And I'm like, no, you don't really look like you are. And he's like, well, I, I think I'm thinking about doing Optavia again, too. And I was like, okay. He's probably just hinting at that so that I get back on it. But tomorrow's the day. Just saying. 
and we're starting magic and we're gonna be drinking all this water. We're gonna be so healthy. Oh, the other thing that I'm gonna do that I decided was that every day, starting tomorrow, I mean, as close as I can to doing this, I'm gonna do my morning and nighttime skincare ritual every day for the next year, which I should be doing anyway, right? But like a lot of times I get up often, I'm trying to say often instead of a lot of times, often I get up and I'm like in a hurry or you know, whatever. And so I don't want to take like the five minutes to like do all that stuff. And uh, which is really all it is. Unless I do like, you know, some kind of longer face mask, like the Lush cup of coffee face mask, like that usually takes me longer. But if I don't do that, um, you know, like it doesn't take me that long. And then in the evening, sometimes I get home and I'm just like, do my prayers and my meditations and then I'm ready to go to bed. I don't want to do any kind of face mask or any of that kind of stuff. But starting for the next year, I'm going to make a conscious effort to do it every night. Do my hydrating face mask every night. My Laneige lip mask. I really want to make a conscious, conscious effort to do it and really see if I feel like it makes a difference. And I drink a lot of water anyway, but I needed to start drinking even more water than I'm drinking already. You know what I mean? So how's your weekend or how was your weekend? Did you have a good weekend? I had a good weekend. It's funny, people keep on asking me, they're like, did you have the best birthday ever? I'm like, um, yeah, I was fine. Like, I'm definitely like next year gonna go out of town for my birthday. Alex and I were talking about that today. We were both like, yeah, we're going. Like Sarah was like, do you guys miss going out of town for your birthdays? And we were like, yes. Like next year, we're going out of town for our birthdays. Our friends that we were talking to, they're going to Greece. They went to Mykonos um, for, they two years ago, their one daughter graduated from high school, and so they all went there as a family. And next year, their other daughter graduates, and so they're going back there as a family. And they were telling us that it's pretty inexpensive to go there, and um, like how beautiful it is, and stuff like that. So I don't know. I didn't even know I was at the end of the video. Kind of. So we might have to look at something like that next year. That keep on doing that going out of focus I don't understand I'm actually really hungry right now I haven't eaten since brunch and I ordered so I got the California Dreamer which is this omelet that has I think they made it with egg whites today which is fine it's healthier for me anyway but it has like avocado jalapenos and some kind of like cheese in it it's good I think. And then I got um, cinnamon toast and uh, crispy potatoes, which are just like, you know, little cut up potatoes that are crispy. But like the crispy potatoes, I wasn't really that hungry for when they came. Because like even Sarah was like, do you care if I have a couple of those? And I was like, no, not at all. Like, I'm not going to finish them. I hardly ate probably even five or ten of them. And then, they're, I mean, they're real little. And my cinnamon toast was on like I had two heels of bread and I was like I am not real down with having I mean it is what it is but I just wasn't feeling it and I finished my omelet but that was all I finished of my stuff I'm kind of hungry now I still have that canker sore on the side of my mouth I cannot believe it It's gone down a little bit, but it's still there. It is such a beautiful evening out. I'm gonna listen to my audiobook for a little bit. And uh, I'm not gonna vlog for a whole lot longer. 
I keep on saying they're going to be short vlogs, and y'all know that it goes on forever and ever and ever. And I say it's not going to be a long vlog tonight, and then it ends up being a really long vlog. But I was talking about hope earlier, you know? I think for me... Like, I really want to think this through. I think when I got out of treatment, it was very much like what I just went through to some degree with, like, judging the pageant. Like, I was really close to the people that I went to treatment with. But the problem with that was that they very quickly started sliding away um, and going back out. So if it started as a group of us that would meet up at meetings, you know, and not, we would meet back at the treatment center for meetings. So we were going to, I was going to almost for my first month, like exclusively, um, like speaker meetings, except for when my friend and I, who got, she called the one that called on New Year's uh, Eve, except for meetings that she and I went to, I was going to like exclusively speaker meetings. And I feel like she and I started going to a lot of those meetings together for, at, I think that's what happened was she and I were going to a lot of those meetings at first because she dated this guy that was in my aftercare group. And, um, she would have met him at like, for like us meeting up at meetings there because he wasn't going to the same meetings that I was going to. Um, And then, so I think that's what it was at first. You know, it was just a lot of like seeing those people and like we had all, it was like the sinking ship theory, you know, that we had all gone through the same thing together. But if it started off as like 10 of us, you know, like I remember we did this one rec activity this one time and there was like 10 of us that were like on the same level. So it was like five guys, five women. And we were doing this like recreational, maybe more than that, but we were doing like this recreational activity with the, the rec uh, counselor. And like we had to go around and look at each other's faces and we had to say this really funny stuff. And we had to say something like, somebody out there will know this game. It's like a team leadership game that you do. But you look at the person in the face and you say something like, um, I love you, baby, but I cannot tell a lie or something like that. And you get them to try to laugh and you have to keep a straight face. Well, we did all these like bonding exercises while we were in there together. So you get out and it's like, you know, you see these people and if you ever, if you want to know what it's really like, it's really like when a man loves a woman, like that movie is so fantastic. It's showing like what getting out of treatment is like. It's scary, but it's new. And really you feel like nobody, except for the people that you've gone through it with, really understand what you've gone through. Even people at meetings that have gone through it before, you're like, yeah, but you don't understand what it was like for me, right? There's kind of like, you know, just a possessiveness around it. So anyway, um, I was going to all these meetings to meet, to meet up with the people that, you know, like I had gone through treatment with, which they tell you not to do anyway. They tell you to, you know, hang out with people that have more time and stuff like that. And, um, I think it was in about 30 days that I realized that it was just about three of us that was left. And the other two guys are still around and, um, they're pretty big deal in like other programs. They've like, they've had, they've held some pretty like national service positions and things like that. But whenever I see them, this one guy is so funny. I see him at the most random places. And, um, but you know, I think about that, like us being in that group, if I looked around that room, I never in a million years, if I had to put my money on three people staying clean and sober for 20 plus years, it sure as shit wouldn't have been the three of us that I would have bet on. I mean, I'm telling you right now, there were some people in there that were saying good stuff and saying what needed to be said. And I felt like they were taking really some like deep looks at themselves. I wasn't, I wasn't taking any kind of deep look at myself in treatment. I was like, when the hell am I getting out of here? You know, towards the end I was, but I was just really kind of afraid of my own shadow. And I just did what I was told. You know, my first six months, besides being in a relationship, um, I mean, I did most of what I was told. But then I'll tell you what happened. You know, I went through two bad breakups that were bad breakups for me. And the second one I've talked about on here a lot, that was Todd, that I found out a couple years ago had passed away. So I went through some pretty tough breakups, but 
the other thing was at six months, and I just talked about this, I think on here not too long ago, I walked out of the meeting into the parking lot and I was like, I have not consistently done something for six months. I, I don't know if ever. And this is the longest I've ever been clean and sober since I was 12 years old. And I was 20, you know, I was gonna, that month I was gonna be, you know, 23. And, cause I got sober at 22 and a half. And I'm like, this is crazy. You know what I mean? 12 years old is the last time that I had this kind of sobriety. And I think something changed in me then. And I think I was like, that's when the hope, like I think, like I think standing there that day, you know, in that parking lot, I was like, I can do this. Like I've done it this far. I can do it. And when people talk about having nine months and a year and 18 months, like I can get, I can do that, you know, and I can do this. And I mean, I really think I have this hope in me that I was like, I, I can do this, you know? Whereas before, I think had you asked me, I would have told you I could do it. But inside, I didn't believe that I could really do it. I just really don't think I did, you know? I think hope is a really powerful thing when you get a glimpse of it, you know? And you start believing in yourself just a little bit. It's like I remember you know, I always said I wanted to write a book. I wanted to write a book. I wanted to write a book. And I had all these ideas, you know, and I still have all these ideas. And I remember talking to this author that I'm friends with and I've like read all of his books and all of his books are like, I mean, the fact that I'm even friends with this man is baffling to me. And he's wrote this, ser he wrote this series that is just, it's like one of my favorite series of life. And I remember talking to him and I said, you know, I have all these ideas for what I want to do with this book, but I don't really know how to write it. And he goes, well, do you think that you're more of a structured writer or more of an organic writer? And I said, I definitely think I'm more of an organic writer, but I really like writing from structure. And he said, you know, and this is what he suggested to me is like, I always, you know, write down all my ideas and then I throw it into kind of an outline and I go like an outline, like one, two, three, A, B, C. He goes, oh yeah, like an outline. I throw it into an outline. And he said, and then like, I go off the outline but then I write organically from the outline. So sometimes it doesn't end up, you know, the outline doesn't turn out the way that it is. And I remember going to my office that day and I sat down and, um, is this that little gas station up here? I want to turn around. I'm like, where is this little gas station? Here it is. And uh, this little gas station is so old and so cute. It's like probably literally the only thing in this town. Um, it's a Phillips 66 gas station. Can you see it? How cute is this little gas station here? It is never open. They even have like a diesel tank in top and back. The gate out back is connected to the gate of the house. I wonder if the people live there. Anyway. Um, oh shoot, what was I just talking about? This has been happening to me a lot lately. I need to be taking that gink, that ginkgo biloba. What was I talking about? Writing the book. Okay, so. Great, like now I'm gonna be following this semi. Um, candy cane. Okay, um, do y'all know what that's from? Joyride, the movie, I love it. But I, um, oh shoot, what was I saying? So I went to my office that day and I sat down and I remember I just sat there and I just started outlining this book and I got like two, like, like two paragraphs or like I was outlining like literally like one intro. <laughs> then I got like intro and then wrote three things down that I wanted to put in the intro and then I was like two, chapter one or whatever. I have this at home. Like I have my whole outline at home. And then I was like, I saw the ending because I knew what I wanted to write in the book, right? And I saw the ending in my head. So I, drew, I took out paper 
and I just like, I think, did I have my computer? I don't even remember, honestly. But I just kind of like started like writing out or typing out or whatever. I just don't honestly know the ending to this book. And I sat there. I'm almost positive I, I like long, like I, I hand wrote it, like in a notebook. And I sat there and I wrote the entire last chapter out. Or like the last two pages of the last chapter. Three pages of it. And I remember I started bawling immediately. And I called Alex. And I was like, I just I just finished my book. And he was like, what? And I was like, because <laughs> he knew. Like, I just started it, you know. And I was like, I just, like, wrote the ending to my book. Like, I know how it's going to end. And for some reason, because I could see the ending of my book, which I will tell you, a lot of my book changed. But the ending did not really change much. It stayed pretty true to what I wrote that day. And... I knew because I could see the beginning and I could see the end, the middle, I could do, right? And I had so much hope that day. Like, for the first time in writing, like, it just kind of all came together for me. And I was like, oh, my God, I can do this. Like, I can do this, you know? And I think that's what it's really all about, you know? It's really about seeing the ability that you have to accomplish something that you want to accomplish. And I think it's about not just seeing it, but then believing it, that you can do it. And I think that's really what hope is about, is, you know, when we talk about a hope for change, or when we talk about, you know, like, a hope for the future, or when we talk about a hope for our future, or a hope for, you know, like, a friendship, or a marriage, or I hope for this career, or whatever, it's like, okay, so maybe your hope is to be, like, I always use this example, like a Broadway actress, right? And, you know, you get a small part in your high school drama class, you know, thing. And you're like, okay, that's hope, right? That you can see that now that door has just opened a little bit wider. And I think that that's what hope is. And I think that hope is powerful. And I think that when we turn ourselves off from hope is when we aren't willing to... Like, I, I think, like... At the times of my life, when I couldn't see hope in anything, my life when I was pretty hopeless about things, was when I just was like, I don't even, I, I was when I, the, the, when I felt the most lost. You know, hope is, doesn't cost anything to have any kind of hope. But it's actually pretty priceless when you think about the acceleration that it can push you, you know, to like get you where you want to get in your life. So when I saw the hope in that girl last night when I was watching that, you know, and I was thinking a lot about myself today and the moments where I've had a lot of hope for myself and hope for others as well or hope for a situation, you know. Anyway, this is all over the place tonight, but I'm going to get off here now and um, I hope you guys are having, an, uh, I hope you're enjoying the beginning to your week. I hope you're having an amazing Monday. Unless you have other plans. But don't have other plans because life is short. It's not a dress rehearsal. I hope you're having an amazing beginning to your July 1st. Um, I, maybe you're doing the skincare routine with me. Maybe you're getting into a healthier eating habits with me. Maybe you're doing the magic book. I hope some of you out there, a lot of you said that you're doing the magic book with me. So I am starting it Monday, July 1st. And um, yeah, and if nobody else has told you this today, I love you. Look in the mirror. Tell yourself that every day. Most importantly, pass it on to somebody else. We all need to hear it. And um, I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Love you.